Okay, I think we're going to get started. It's officially one o'clock and here is an official welcome. We are so thrilled you're here for Storytelling Math. I am Leslie Esslinger, the Director of Education at Becker School Supplies, along with an incredible team that is behind the scenes helping to make sure that everything goes smoothly for us today. Thank you, Terry, Marilyn, and Kathy. Your help is invaluable. Uh, we've been so eager to bring this presentation to you. We've been planning it and dreaming about it for a long time. Ever since I saw one of the authors do a presentation, I knew this was something really special we wanted to bring to all of uh, the people that we, we work with in the different states and we have a wide representation. Uh, you're gonna hear about lots of math co concepts, obviously, since we're celebrating math today and storytelling, but we're also gonna see so much about in these books about caring, sharing, problem solving, kindness, a little arguing between siblings, a friendship. So, so many also social emotional skills that come out in these books. I think you'll really enjoy them. Let's go to the next slide. That's a necessary task. And the answers to these these three questions are yes, yes, yes. You will receive a certificate. There will be a recording available. You will get all that by email after um, within 24 hours after the session. And we have terrific additional resource materials available for you to download. Uh, those links will be placed in the chat box and we will see that we'll see them at the end on um, the ending slides where you can link to get everything we're gonna be talking about today. Um, and I know you're all looking forward to getting your certificate. And if you could go to the next slide, and I have this wonderful opportunity to introduce these terrific people. You can see just by the brief descriptions on screen that we have an esteemed and very accomplished panel of presenters. So we're gonna move from left to right in the order in which they're gonna present. First up is Alyssa, and she will briefly introduce Storytelling Math books and the Storytelling Math Project. Alyssa is passionate about bringing nonfiction titles to readers that are innovative and include authentic, which is really an important word, authentic representation of diversity. Next up, we will hear from Marlene Kleiman. She brings over 25 years of research and development work to projects that focus on mathematics. Not that we're biased in this field of early childhood, but we're thrilled that she knows how critically important it is to recognize our youngest learners as math thinkers. I love that term here. Um, Marlene works as a consultant for this work in this case as a consultant for the storytelling math project and she did some terrific support. Uh, we're also so fortunate to have two authors. We have Grace Lynn. Her accomplishments are way too long to fit in this little box here. After I viewed a presentation of her newest books, I knew you'd all want to meet her firsthand. So we're so excited she can join us. She has a keen understanding of what is important to a young child and how to make a story relatable and include characters reflective of the children that we teach. And Anna, welcome Anna, Anna Crespo, born in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. She started her career in the field of education and then fell in love with children's books when she began read reading to her own children. Similar to Grace's experience, she did not find exactly the cultural diversity she was looking for, so she took up writing with this goal in mind. I hope that's enough to let you know that we have something very special in store for you, and now I'm turning it over to Alyssa. Thanks, Leslie, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, today we're going to be talking about math, diversity, and the power of story and how all those elements come together in Storytelling Math, a new series of board books and picture books. You'll get a behind the scenes look at how Grace and Anna develop their stories and learn how to extend the math beyond the books into the classroom and the home. We'll also talk about why diversity is so important in children's math books. So let's start off talking a little bit about Storytelling Math's mission. Uh, Marlene, could you please tell us how and why you came up with the idea for the series? Sure. Um, as early childhood professionals, we know that picture books are a very powerful way to help children make sense of the world around them. But when it comes to picture books intended to help children make sense of math, I found that there's a dearth of books with some important qualities. 
A lot of the math picture books in print have animal and white main characters, but few have main characters of color and very few are written by authors of color. Many math picture books center on counting your shapes, but there are other math topics that are also important for young children to experience like sorting, measuring and spatial relationships. And most of the books are more about math than about great stories with character development and compelling narratives that reflect the social and emotional lives of young children. So Kim Brennan at the Heising Simons Foundation contacted me about helping to develop a picture book series that offers a very different vision of what math is, who is a mathematical thinker, who can create math picture books, and what a math story can be. So in turn, I contacted Charles Bridge to work with me on this. Melissa? And so we were really excited when Marlene reached out to us because, I mean, here was this fantastic idea for um, changing the landscape of children's math literature. So storytelling math books are different in three key ways. They offer a different vision of who, what math is and who, who's a mathematical thinker. They star, math, um, they star main characters of color and nearly all are written by authors who are writing stories about their own culture. They feature important but often overlooked math topics like patterns and spatial relationships that research shows are important for young children's success in all subjects, including reading. And they feature really compelling, engaging stories that kids want to read again and again. You know, we expect in a great picture book, characters you care about, stories that stick with you, and you, you want to know what happens next. Why not expect the same of math picture books? So Marlene came to Charlesbridge with this exciting new idea. We start, we said, yes, please. And then we started about talking about possible authors. And the first name to come up was Grace Linz. So Grace and I had wanted to do board books for a very long time, but we couldn't quite figure out the right topic. But then, Grace, would you like to tell the story? Sure, uh, if you could go to the next slide. Okay. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Grace Lynn. Thanks so much for being here. And thanks so much for um, having me on board. So uh, as you already know, <laughs> I'm Grace Lynn. And I'm the author and illustrator of these board books right here. Um, now, these board books came out last year. But really, the seed of these books began probably over nine years ago. Um, next slide. That's because nine years ago, I became a new mom. That's me and my baby nine years ago. Uh, looking at that makes me feel really old <laughs> because time has really flied. Bloom, flown, flown. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, being a very dutiful children's book author, I surrounded my baby with books. Um, and I read to her before she was born and after she was born every day, every appropriate moment. I really wanted her life to be infused with books. Uh, next slide, please. Um, but almost immediately, uh, I found myself frustrated with the books meant for babies. Very few at the time, now it's much better now, don't get me wrong, but this is, remember this is nine years ago. So very few, featured babies or toddlers of color. Very few featured mothers that look like me or babies that look like my daughter. Um, the very few books that I did find starring babies of color, um, most of them were part of the Global Fund for Children series. And those are really lovely. If you know anything about um, baby books, they're really beautiful. They're all photos, uh, but they're all photos of babies from other countries. Uh, and the thing is that even though that these books were very lovely, um, they still kind of gave the impression that non non white babies were kind of slightly exotic, you know, they're from other places, and they were not commonplace in, you know, mainstream America. Um, so as that kind of as I saw that over and over again, that kind of planted a deep seed in me to create board books that showed babies of color doing ordinary everyday things. Babies like my own in Main Street America. Mainstream America, Main Street, Main Street. <laughs> Next slide, please. 
So um, a few years ago, um, I was at an NCTE conference and I ran into Alyssa and I was at the Charles Bridge booth and I was admiring their Baby Love series because um, the Baby Love series has a, divi a diverse um, is a diverse series. It has uh, characters of colors throughout the series. And I was really excited when I saw those. <clears throat> and I was said, oh my gosh, I, I'm so happy that you have these books with babies of color, uh, BIPOC babies, because you know that's really what I wanted when, when my daughter was a baby. And I really want to make, wanted to make these kinds of books too. And Alyssa said, oh, well, you should make some with us. And I said, okay. And we started talking and we brainstormed a bunch of different ideas, but none of them quite seemed right. And then a couple years ago, um, Alyssa contacted me because Charles Bridge was teaming up with Turk. I guess Marlene had, had approached them at that point, and she said uh, to approach them about the storytelling math series. And Alyssa called me up and she's like, okay, I know that we want to do a board book series and you want to do board books. Would you be interested in making math board books? And I, I kind of hesitated. I said, math, you know, like numbers. And she said, no, no, no. We want to show that math is much more than numbers. We want to show that math is ordinary and just a part of our everyday lives. And when Alyssa said this, um, I realized that their ambition with math perfectly aligned with what I wanted to do uh, with diversity in board books. And that was like, oh, wow, it's the perfect match. Um, next slide, please. So Alyssa and I decided that a small series of four board books would probably be the most successful to accomplish our goals. And uh, we, Alyssa and I both live in New England and we have four seasons here. So it made sense to use the seasons as a framework. So um, the Asian girl, May, is uh, the, uh, the girl in the series, is based on my own daughter. And Olivia and Manny, the other two characters, are based on her friends, uh, visually as well as personality-wise. Um, I, I purposely focused uh, each of these books um, using the everyday fun that she has alone and with her friends because I wanted to show that these characters and math exist in our everyday lives. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so this is my younger daughter, uh, my daughter <laughs> who um, I used as May, uh, though I used the haircut she had when she was much younger. And this is her good friend, um, this is her good friend whom I used as the model for Olivia. Even though the style of illustration that I use for these board books is not very realistic, um, I felt it was still really important to use models. So these, these are the models I used. <clears throat> for me as an illustrator, when I create pictures of children outside of my own race, I feel like photo reference is extremely important, but because, with, because without it, it's really easy to accidentally create a racial stereotype. And that is really what I did not want to do. Next slide. Okay, so this this kind of maybe you might see like there's a little photo in the like right hand picture there. You can see there's my daughter's old haircut. Excuse me, her old haircut a little bit better. <laughs> so um, these board books are actually very synchronous with all the things that I've been trying to achieve in all of my books. So you can see I've been making books for quite a long time, and uh, and there's. Uh, things that I've always been trying to achieve. Um, I am a huge proponent and supporter of diverse books, but one of the things I'm eager, so eager for educators to do is to kind of unlimit their diverse books. Um, I think there's a misconception that we read books about Asians on Lunar New Year, or we read about books about Black people on during Black History Month, but the truth is diversity is every day and should be shared that way. And it's the same thing with math. I found that I had similar limiting beliefs about math. At first, all I could think about was like, math is numbers, math is numbers, and that these books had to be about kids counting. But after many talks with Marlene, thank you, Marlene, uh, the, she's, um, 
I think she'll be talking more soon. <laughs> she really, really opened my eyes uh, to how we use math every day without even knowing it. We use it for sorting, sharing, comparing, finding, even waiting. Uh, next slide, please. So math, like diversity, is and should be acknowledged for its everyday existence. But that does not mean that it's boring. And I think what is so wonderful about these books, um, about all books in general, actually, is how books can acknowledge how extraordinary ordinary things are to a child. So, you know, picking out vegetables at a farmer's market is probably like a really commonplace action to most adults. But to a young child, it's a really big deal. To pick something to purchase is like a momentous action, something that takes a lot of thought. So it's really taking the child's perspective in these books. Uh, next slide. And then um, in this book, Circle Sphere, it's the wonder of blowing bubbles. You know, as adults, we know that when we blow, we're going to get a round bubble. But to a young child, this is really unexpected magic with many, many questions. And these board books empower kids by recognizing the exceptional nature of these simple events while being interwoven with experiences of diversity and math. So um, I'm gonna read you just a couple pages of this book, which I hope kind of illustrates what I mean. Okay, so this is Circle Sphere. And just so you know that this is the, uh, this is May, the one based on my daughter. This is Olivia based on her friend. And this is Manny, <clears throat> another character that is based on her friend. What, another friend of hers. All right. <clears throat> Oops. Yes, okay, we're on this page. <laughs> Let's blow bubbles. Soapy water for us to share. A bubble wand for each of us. So here you have three friends. They're about to blow bubbles. You can see the soapy wand. And also already you see a little bit of a hint that these wands are different. They all, they're, they're all gonna be used to blow bubbles, but they're each different. And you know, in a way that's a kind of a nod to these friends that they're great friends, uh, but they're all a little different, you know, visually. Okay, next slide. These pages are stuck. Whoops, sorry, my page got stuck. <laughs> there we go. So many shapes, circle, triangle, and heart. What bubble shape will each wand make? So, you know, uh, like I said, this is kind of taking this very simple action of blowing bubbles and showing how there really is so much wonder and mystery to a small child about that. You know, when a child gets a triangle wand, you know, the first, there, there's always something in their head like, what shape will blow out? Will I get a triangle bubble, you know, or will I even get a bubble at all? So these are all things that are really, really interesting. Or, you know, the idea that these are flat and the fact when you blow it, it will create something 3D, which is something that um, Marlene will talk about next in the activity that goes along with this book. So Marlene, come on up. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> so as Grace said, the story takes the everyday experience of blowing bubbles and highlights the inherent opportunities for children to engage with math ideas like round, flat, spherical, 2D and 3D. We say math is all around us, but if, we attended to it, it would be a very different world. So this helps you attend to it. Um, and anyway, each storytelling math book comes with math information and some activities at the back of the book and it's free downloads. And Grace is gonna show you one of the activities that further explores relationships between 2D and 3D shapes. So with bubbles, we go from you know flat to big and round. And here we go in the opposite direction. Time for the video. This is my daughter, by the way. <laughs> I made three different cones. They're all cones. Wow, and they each one made what shape? A circle! Yay! All of them made So um, I think we're going 
to the next slide. Yes. Okay. So the grace, the activity Grace just showed, squash it, or a little piece of the activity promotes learning in a very tactile and physical way, which is an important way to learn math at all ages. As children do the activity, they start building a bank of concrete experiences with shapes that will help them make sense of geometry when they study it in school in a more abstract way. The activity can offer a math experience, you know, creating shapes with Play-Doh and then squashing them to children of a wide age range. Babies and toddlers can participate and experience that transition from big and round to flat by just squashing. Um, but young school age children, like the ones that Grace was with, can also talk about the process. They can predict, as you saw, they can reflect, and that way they can deepen their understanding. So Grace does the activity with just a few kids, but you can do it one-on-one -on -one or with a larger group, whether you're at home, in the library, or in a childcare program, or in a classroom. So as you see here, at the back of each of our storytelling math books, there's an explanation of the math written by a leading math education expert, activities that extend the math, and some of the activities are available as free downloads. So any more about the math from anyone or? Um, I just want to say that these activities are really, really wonderful. Um, and so much of, of realizing how, uh, of taking what I was saying about the extraordinary, the ordinary, making the ordinary extraordinary is really just paying attention. And doing these activities is just a way to help you pay attention to the math in your life. And I think that once you start doing them, like, I, like you saw, I did it with my daughter, like you start seeing it everywhere, like all these different things. And it's really a really kind of, magical thing to experience life with like a, a whole new different lens in a way. And I'm going to jump on too, because I think one of the things I loved in the uh, the last marshmallow was uh, the point that was made in the activity section about fair does not always mean equal. And I thought that was just such a great concept. So as you can see, again, it's not just the math concepts, but so many good social concepts are coming out of this as, as well. And obviously with our new understanding of equity, fair does not always mean equal. And I just think it's a, it's a great concept. So make sure when you do get these books, look at these books, um, to really pay attention to the added uh, information at the end. It's really insightful. Now, just to add to that, in that particular book, there are two kids sharing three marshmallows and they're trying to figure out how to do it. And Grace just did an amazing job on their facial expressions. And they're, they're angry, you know, who's gonna get that marshmallow? Can we find a way to share it? And there's just so much emotion. You know, if this were a word problem, then you'd know what to do. You'd everyone get one and a half, stories done over. But there is, you know, there's a lot more in life than finding a mathematical solution. Math might be part of the solution, but there's emotions too. I just wanted to add one more thing about math um, being the solution, because I think that is uh, really, really important that I kind of want to reemphasize, especially for the last marshmallow. It's the idea that um, we have two kids here. Whoops, I'm going to, all my pages are stuck together. <laughs> so, so we have two kids here who um, who basically have a problem and they have to kind of solve it themselves. And what's, what's lovely is that they use math to solve their problem. And I think that's the whole message that we're trying to set, send to young readers is that math can help you find the solution and many times is the solution. Okay, yeah, uh, the stories are really great, featuring empowered kids solving their own problems, and they're going to keep on finding math in their everyday life. Um, we're going to give a little sneak peek of, into what's next for Olivia, May, and Manny. Um, Grace is working on the next four board books. Uh, we, one is Our Favorite Apples, which, star, which um, stars all three kids and is about sorting and classifying. Where are the eggs? Stars May, and it's about spatial sense. And there are two other books also coming, one about patterns and one about number sense. So I'm, I just love these cover sketches and I can't wait to see all of the sketches, Grace. So as we mentioned, 
Um, storytelling math includes both board books and picture books. Uh, to find the picture books, Marlene and I put out a call for manuscripts. We received more than 500 submissions by some very talented authors. It was a real challenge to choose the best of the best. But the very first story we chose was a no brainer. Um, Leah and Luis, Who Has More by Anna Kreshbo. We immediately fell in love with Anna's charming characters, playful writing, and seemingly effortless incorporation of math. And the story came about because of a chance encounter. Could you tell us, a, give us a behind the scenes look at the book, Anna? Sure. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. I am Anna Crespo, the author of a few books, including Lee and Louise, who has more, and of the sequel as well that is coming out next year. But let me talk about this, Lee and Louise, if you can change to the next slide, Alyssa, please. So I was born and raised in the beautiful city of Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, and I currently live in Colorado, at the foothills of the Rocky Mountains, where I love all the trees and the forests and everything, but I very much miss the ocean. Um, I did meet, meet Alisa by accident during the Public Library Association Conference, which was in Denver. I don't remember the year exactly, but I think it, maybe it was 2018, not sure. Um, um, so I met Alyssa and she did mention the, the call for submissions for a series. They, they didn't have a name for the series yet, but it was a series uh, by diverse authors featuring diverse characters in mathematical plots. And so she asked me if uh, she could send me the, the file with the details of the series. And I said, yeah, sure. But only because authors are usually like, really looking forward for opportunities to connect with editors, I really didn't think that I would be able to write that. And um, so anyway, so Alyssa sent me the, 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 the document and I continued to think that I wouldn't be able to write the book just because I had never written a book based on a prompt before. So it was very new to me. And part of the problem that I had was that I kept thinking about the math and the math and the math and I was focusing on the math but really the idea was to have a book a, a story right the idea was to have a story that would flow really really well and have a, a, a plot that was based on math uh, actually can we keep yes the real just for a little once a little while um so anyway, um, so then what I had to do was that I had to um, stop thinking about the math and you start thinking about my childhood and my culture. And it was really like a memory exercise. I tried to remember the games that I played with my friends, the routines, my time at school. And I finally remembered this one question that my parents used to ask me, what weighs more? a kilo of lead or a kilo of cotton? And I do understand that this sounds like a very weird question for uh, 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 Americans likely, um, because you know what kid knows what lead is? But uh, in Brazil, we use the word chumbo, which means lead to re refer to very heavy things. And so even if a kid doesn't know what lead is, the kid will know that lead is very, very heavy. It's like an expression almost. And so, of course, one kilo of lead and one kilo of cotton both weigh the same, but a kilo of cotton will occupy a lot more space than a, ki a kilo of lead. And that's really how the premise for Lee and Louise came about. And now the next slide, please. So what I had to do was to substitute the, the lead and the cotton for food. And so for the cotton, I picked Biscoito de Povilho, the little white one there, um, which is a very, very airy snack. It's, so it's very light, made with tapioca flour. So for comparison, think of uh, Cheetos. Just it doesn't get, have that uh, yellow thing that, uh, you know, gets 
attached to your fingers and never comes out. And uh, so it's like a very healthy Cheetos, I guess. And uh, for the lad, I picked coxinha de galinha because it's this made with this very heavy dough and it's filled with chicken and catupiry cheese. And so if you have a Brazilian bakery close by, you should certainly try those. Um, and so anyway, so once those were picked, then it was a matter of figuring out the plot. Well, I have two uh, younger siblings, uh, very close in age, and we did fight a lot, really a lot. Um, and uh, sibling rivalry is such a universal theme that, and so many people can relate to it. That's just, it was the natural way to go. Now, if we can go to the, the next slide. So this book is only about 300 words long, right? I, I don't know the exact number of words, but it's around 300 words. And so often people are very surprised when I mention all the back and forth conversations that Alyssa, Merlene, and I had. So in the image before this one, you saw that there was a ruler. Well, I drove to the nearest Brazilian bakery, which is uh, an hour away from where I live, and I bought some coxinha de galinha and some biscoito de polvilho. And so I measured everything, weighed everything, ate everything too, which was the best part. Uh, but uh, eventually what we had was that we knew that the coxinha de galinha weighed 75 grams. We knew that the uh, bag of biscoito de polvilho weighed 100 grams. And so we knew, um, spoiler alert, because I'm gonna uh, ruin the end of the book, but we knew that for both kids to have the exact same weight of snacks, Leo would need to share about a third of the coxinha with Louise. And uh, as you can see in the image right now, it didn't stop there, right? Uh, Merlene developed this um, guide, I guess, um, with the details, like the sizes of the blocks that are featured in the, in the book, the size of the bag, uh, how many biscuits are in the bag, all this detail to develop this book made the book extremely, uh, um, authentic culturally, but also mathematically possible, which is something that I wanted it to be. I wanted it to be mathematically possible. So anyway, so that's how Lee and Louise came about. And I think we do have a few uh, slides with the first few spreads. Yeah, so this is the cover one more time for you to remember. And I'm going to read it from the screen, Alyssa. So so this is uh, Lee and Louise, Who Has More, written by me and illustrated by Giovanna Medeiros, who is also from Brazil and so helped the book be even more authentic. And uh, it is published by Charles Bridge. So let's get started. Louise is always quick to brag. My tower is taller. Usually his sister doesn't mind. I know, Leah enjoys taking her time. But when they run downstairs to their family's store and pick their favorite Brazilian snacks, I want biscoito de polvilho, papai, coxinha de galinha, please. Louise starts bragging, I have more, and Leah doesn't like it. And so in the previous spread, you'll see that um, I didn't write anything about it in the manuscript. Of course, this was all Giovanna, but you will see that the image, the, 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 um, the little snacks that you see close to Leah, the little uh, black balls on the bottom, those are Brigadeiro. They are Giovanna's favorite and very traditional Brazilian. And there, there's like some milk put, pudding and some coxinha de galinha, some risoli. All of that makes the book very authentic. Uh, uh, Brazilian cage who actually sees that picture will recognize all those snacks that are there. But I'll let Merlene talk a little bit about the math in the book. Okay. 
Leah Louise throughout Explore Measurement exactly the way young children learn best by really a hands-on visual comparing sizes, amounts, and weights. We see their mathematical thinking in action throughout the book as they try to determine who has more. And, and actually it kind of ups the tension. So it's very much connected. The math and the plot and the tension are related. You could even read through the book and barely even see that there's a lot of math in. So first they do what the very youngest children reading this book would do is they look at general size, which looks bigger. Well, Luisa's package is quite big. Um, next slide, please. So as children move through the preschool and pre-K years into elementary school, they start noticing and comparing along three dimensions, length, width, and height. And of course, this is relevant for older kids. You know, it's taller, it's wider, it's deeper. So they, they start unpacking big to just what does it mean to be big or bigger? Next slide. Um, another way they try comparing is by amount, 100 little, biscuits in the bag versus just two croquettes. Now, even if their readers are way too young to count 100 objects, they know that there are a lot more biscuits. So who has more? It certainly looks like Luis does. Next slide, please. But then Leah thinks about weight. She holds them up. One biscuit, she notices, it's much smaller and lighter than a croquette. So she's actually starting to make sense of density. We don't use that word because this is, this is an engaging story. It's not a lesson, um, but density is, is key here. And it's a topic that spans math and science. Next slide. So finally, they decide to compare by weighing. The balance scale gives children a visual representation of comparing weight long before they can meaningfully compare, say, pounds and ounces or calculate density. All the, calc all the comparisons that they make are very age appropriate. They reflect the way young children really think about who has more. And it's probably something that's very familiar to readers. They may not have thought about it as math, but as with Circle Sphere, it gets these math ideas out on the page so that readers can naturally reflect on and talk about different ways to measure and compare. And let's see, before we go on to the activity, Anna, were you gonna talk a little bit about some additional thinking about ways that could compare that came up in one of your sessions? Yeah, so um, Merlene was excited when she heard uh, the experience that I had during a virtual visit at a school. So I, I read uh, Lee and Louise, and these were first graders. And uh, this one boy raised his hand. And of course, with children, you never know what it's going to come out, right? A lot of times they ask, do you like cake? Or what is your favorite color or something? And you don't know if you're connecting with them. But this one boy raised his hand and he said, well, if they put 50 biscuits on one side and 50 biscuits on the other, in one, and I don't remember, I think it was croquette, the word he is, in one croquette on one side and one croquette on the other, it would be the same too. And I think that's the kind of thinking that uh, uh, Merlene was really hoping that the kids would come out of it. And so she was excited to hear that experience. Yeah, and you don't know if the kid may have been thinking about it as math or may have been thinking as I have a sibling and this is what I would do to make it fair because I've been in that situation before. So it, it just gets them reflecting and talking. Let's see, next slide, please. So here um, you see information about the math and some activity ideas that allow for further exploring the math, um, both at the back of the book and they're, they're available as free downloads. And we also have a Brazilian Portuguese glossary and Anna is now gonna show you an activity. <laughs> okay. So I'm very big on this screen right now. Okay, so uh, there are many different activities, of course, that you can do with this. Um, and like Marlene said, Charles Bridge have them available, has them available on the website if you wanna download them in different languages. In the case of Lee and Louise, it's available also in Brazil and Portuguese, but uh, other books like Luna, uh, I forgot the title, but Luna's book uh, is available in Chinese as well, as far as I understand. So there are many 
many options there on the website. You should certainly visit it. But for this activity, you're going to need um, a beach ball, a soccer ball, and a baseball. And you can start. Here's the beach ball that took me almost an hour to inflate. Um, but uh, you can start in here. I just want to show you what I have here. Um, so the soccer ball, and I cannot put them all on the screen together. So in the baseball, right? And so you can um, start by asking the students to describe each one of the balls. And they might say like one is colorful, the other is orange, but hopefully at some point they're, they're going to mention sizes as well. And if they don't, you can always prompt them and ask which ball is the biggest, which one is the smallest? Is the soccer ball bigger than the baseball? Is the baseball smaller than the beach ball? And so it goes. And notice that when you're doing that, you're not only encouraging the mathematical thinking by comparison itself, but you're also helping them develop their comparative and superlative knowledge, making this really an interdisciplinary activity that makes this both language and math. Uh, then ask them, which ball do you think is the heaviest, right? Because that's like, if you think about the question that prompted Lee and Louise, the beach ball would be the cotton and the baseball would be the ledge. One is much, much bigger than the other, but the beach ball is lighter. So, Anyway, have them guess the answer and only them then allow them to, to hold the balls and actually feel which one is heavier and which one is lighter. So um, can they actually, can they put the balls in order from the lightest to the heaviest, which just, uh, um, fell on the ground, so I'm not going to get it, but, uh, or, or even like from the smallest to the biggest. So there's a lot that you can do with this. And these are such simple objects. You can use them inside the classroom or you can take them outside and have them kick the balls and, and experience them in a different, different way. I also encourage you to make a balanced scale with, you just need a, a little hanger like some string and some disposable cups and the kids can uh, um, start weighing everything around from Lego pieces to um, marbles to rocks, anything that they can find. So that's what I have. Thank you so much. What I love about the activities is they really work for all ages and you know, like think about the, the balls, holding the balls. You can imagine a toddler doing that and starting to get a sense of size and weight. Um, it's a catalyst for vocabulary, but you can also imagine really a thoughtful, you know, elementary school project based on it, making the hangers or talking about which weighs the most because it kind of broaches the concept of density. Um, kids start having to do density calculations and they meet density in science and math in elementary school, but often they have no real sense of what that means. And if you, if you imagine you know, a baseball versus a beach ball, well, that's, that's density right there. So it, activities like this give all ages a chance to build that underlying understanding. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. And now I am going to give you all a sneak peek at what Leah and Luis are up to next. So coming next fall is Leah and Luis puzzled. Grandma sends the twins a gift, a puzzle. And can detectives Leah and Luis put it together to read the secret message? Um, and there we see Detective Leah, who is just so cute. And spoiler alert, the message says that grandma is coming to visit. So puzzles are a fantastic way for kids to develop their spatial skills. As they put the puzzle together, Leah and Luis are exploring shapes and rotation and logic and sorting. And right now, Giovanna is developing the sketches and working with Anna and me and the art director to figure out what elements of Brazilian culture are going to be throughout the art. And that leads us to our last conversation about the importance of diversity in children's math books. I think next slide, yes. 
So all of these books show children of color as strong mathematical thinkers, as well as, as fully realized characters. Young readers of color need to see themselves reflected in math picture books, and all readers need to see children of color engaging in mathematical thinking. Research shows that stereotypes about who is a mathematical thinker and who is not begin as early as preschool. So children enter preschool with preconceptions of their mathematical strengths and of the mathematical strengths of their classmates. And further, research tells us that even the most well-meaning adults can hold unconscious bias about children's math abilities based on race. Picture books have a very important role to play in mitigating bias and in helping everyone literally see children of color as strong mathematical thinkers. Again, research tells us that children who start school with strong early math skills are more likely to succeed in all school subjects, including in reading. We want all children to have an opportunity to experience that success. So there's... Wanna join in and talk about it or should we talk <laughs> about the other books? Or... Um, uh, I thought I would, this isn't exactly about math, but when you were talking about modeling, I thought that was such a really important thing, like modeling how, how um, kids can see themselves. And we talk about this a lot when we talk about diversity too, you know, that kids need to be able to see themselves in a book. They need to be able to see themselves as a main character of a book because by seeing themselves as a main character, they can see themselves as the hero in their own story. It empowers them, right? Um, one of the things, this is one of the things that has happened in my experience. Um, so, as you can see, I've been publishing books for quite a long time <laughs> and uh, I've been visiting schools for quite a long time. And I remember at one school, um, this, was, this was probably fairly early in my career, I would say this is probably 15 years ago. I remember the principal came to me and he said, oh, I am so glad that you came to our school. We've we're making such an effort to get more diverse, um, more diverse models uh, for our kids. And I said, oh, that's so wonderful. Why? Uh, I'm just so curious, like what, because uh, remember this is like 15 years ago before diversity, before like we need diverse books, before all these things, before people were really aware of it. And so to me, I was very curious, like, I'm so glad that you you are thinking about this, but what, what brought it on? He's like, well, the truth is, um, a couple months ago, uh, I was I was hanging out after school, and there was like this after school program, and um, and there's a mother and a son. Uh, they were both black. They were sitting in the gym. I think they were waiting for something, and uh, the the mother was saying to the son, "What do you want to be when you grow up?" And, he, and, she, and he's like, oh, "I don't know." And she said, "Well, how about?" how about a uh, fireman? And he's like, oh, I don't know. And then he's, she's like, well, how about a teacher? And the boy said, I can't be a teacher. All teachers are white. And the principal said that broke his heart so much. But then he looked at his staff and he realized that is what this boy was seeing. All the teachers were white. And so by seeing that, he, this boy felt like that was not something for him. And so by bringing authors in of color by, and remember, like I said, this is like 15 years ago when there were diverse books was really, really just not, not a thing. <laughs> and so, and the bookshelves were, it didn't show anyone that looked like, looked like the student either, or very few, or the ones that did were about, civil rights and slavery, you know, like those are things that that kids start to ingest. And there's nothing wrong with those books, but if those are the only books, they start thinking that those are the limits that they have. And this series is such a wonderful way to show kids that they are unlimited. That's great. So it, you see there's a few other books, they all are that 
that um, Becker's has in the series, they all have strong math, a powerfully emotionally resonant story and diversity. They show kids that they deserve to be in books. They don't just deserve to be in history books, but kids of color deserve to be starring in their own stories. So in Bracelets, Rabina's Brothers, that one centers on the Indian holiday Raksha Bandhan, a little girl trying to prove herself to her big brothers and the math of patterns. The Animals Could Not Sleep blends the math of sorting and caring. It's a real empathy story um, with classifying um, and logic. And in Luna's Yum Yum Dim Sum, Luna and her two brothers puzzle over how the three of them can share five buns fairly. They grapple with division and fractions without actually using symbols or equations. So they do it in a very age appropriate way. Um, all the books have math information at the back, activities at the back, and additional free uh, download activities. And uh, one thing that I, I started saying, but then I noticed I was muted. So no matter how long it's oh. been, right, you always start talking and it's still muted. But anyway, but I had a similar experience to Grace's um, before about six years ago when my first book came out and um, I went to a school and I had to introduce myself to the lady at the front at the front desk so that she could let me in. And this one kid was coming in at the same time, and she was Latina. And she, um, when the lady asked me, uh, "So who are you?" and I said, "Oh, I'm Anna Crespo. I am the author." And the little girl looked at me and she said, "You were the author?" And I was, "Yes." I am the author. And, and with me, especially, I think um, what happens as a mom too, and also as the as an author is the accent, the accent makes a difference. So a lot of times, uh, uh, people make assumptions based on the accent, right? So maybe English is not your first language, which is not mine. And of course, you're going to have an accent when you're speaking a second language. Uh, but that doesn't mean, for example, that you don't know math or that you don't know science, right? But a lot of times there are expectations that come with, with the simple accent. You hear an accent and you assume that this person knows less than you or, or that this person is not capable of understanding something. Um, and so anyway, so yeah, yeah. I think it's, it's very important for the kids to be able to see themselves in books, but also to be able to see diverse authors and diverse illustrators being authors and talking to people and being, you know, experts on something. That's all, all very important as well. So I'm glad uh, uh, Grace shared that story. That is a very good story. Um, I see that somebody um, says in the in the question and answer, someone asked why board books, <laughs> and uh, uh, Alyssa, do you want to start the answer for that, or do you want me to do you want me to try? <laughs> well, I should have said from the very beginning that um, the board books are intended for ages zero through two, and then the picture books are for ages three through six. And uh, we were Marlene was very very thoughtful and careful about developing the math for the right age group. And so she, she was always saying, you know, kids of this age know, they, they know this about spatial sense. And then as they grow older and learn more, they know this. And um, Marlene, did you want to talk a little bit about the specifics? So, so the, the series is very much age appropriate. And just to yes. let you know, Marlene, how, how the question was posed was, I'm not sure if you're looking at it, is why did you choose board books? How young will a child understand them? Mm -hmm. Okay, I would, you know, children learn math from birth. They start classifying things. They know which, you know, who's my parents and who isn't my parents. Well, that grows, that grows. Um, they know dark and light. They start discriminating colors and objects and, what we're doing is taking that early math. Yes, there's a lot that children learn naturally and organically, but 
but we're giving you a chance to talk about it. We're showing it to you on the page, sort of formalizing it. As Grace said, it's, it's all around us, but we're choosing a few elements to put a spotlight on so that children and their caregivers see it on the page, um, can, can then start looking in their everyday lives for it. That's why we conscientiously didn't write fantasy, didn't write you know history, we wanted it to reflect what's in the, What's in the world of, a, of a, a child in the United States right now, or a child, child in the United States who may well come from a, a another country or who uh, may not speak English, but, but what's in your world? And we highlight that math. Um, it's very important for young children to have those math conversations. And if they're too young to talk, the adult reads and talks to them, just like you, as Grace was saying, just like you read, to your baby from, from day one or before you even give birth. It's important to have those math conversations too. Yes, <clears throat> math conversations and diversity. I mean, obviously Marlene is the math and I'm gonna keep pounding in the diversity thing because we have found that, um, not me personally, but studies have found that um, kids actually form ideas about race really early on, as early as preschool. And so, for many, like I uh, live in Western Massachusetts, um, it's 80% white here. Um, and so for kids who may not live in a population of a, a diverse population, who may not see a lot of races around them, it's so important to show that in books, you know, like it's, it's not a substitute, but it's at least a first step to show them, you know, the world is populated with people <laughs> that either look like you or don't look like you, you know, like there's a global majority out there that might not be exactly the same as the population that surrounds you. I'm just looking at the time. Thank you, Grace. And I just want to um, start to wrap. I know that the, the people that are on, um, some of their children are probably waking up from nap soon. So um, just a, a, a huge thank you. I think we delivered on what we promised, which was really passionate presenters. Uh, and, and I think to our presenters, we delivered a very kind audience just by reading the chat. Um, they were so engaged. I think they were so um, thrilled to see that we have put these kinds of materials on the market and now to fully understand what's behind it. I mean, that, I think as Grace said during our pra practice session, you know, my book is only six pages long or whatever the board <laughs> book is, but it's packed with so much thought and um, clear, clear intentions of what, what they wanted to communicate. So a huge thank you to everyone. I want to let everybody know you're welcome to still write in the chat. We fully understand if you need to drop off um, these as um, I think our, our folks, Marilyn and Terry, were chatting along that everything is available, including additional resources. Um, we will soon have the recording posted as well at this link shopbecker.com storytelling math and we do have a promo code for you we really would love to, to um, help you bring these books into your classrooms we know budgets are tight these books are are very reasonably priced and we and on top of that we just kind of couldn't help but give you an additional prompt to hope that you will make it to our website and place your orders just to let you know the spanish versions and i'm not sure if we have an update uh, from the editor here but um they were a bit delayed because just how all the supplies have been delayed, the supply chain situation, but uh, you can order them now. The, the board books are all available. The, the books uh, that Anna wrote, Leah and Louise, and the rest of that uh, paperback books are available as well. So we encourage you to, to bring them into your classrooms and, and get these messages out, which are just so all important. If anybody has additional questions for our presenters, please feel free. I think I kind of warned them that we might have to hang in a little later, longer because our engaged, and I can see, I'm looking at the numbers. There's still so many people signed on that are just not ready to leave yet. So if you do have questions, we could try to address them in the, in the question and answer box. But just a huge thank you to everyone. Um, it, I even saw somebody said like they were almost moved to tears. And, and, and I've read a lot of chats and chat boxes, but my favorite one I think so far 
is somebody said in capital letters, take my money. There should be more books like this. So I, I just think uh, it's a win-win for everybody. So many, many thanks for being here. Yes, thanks so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you to Thank the you. authors <laughs> for coming up with these amazing books. Oh, for all the collaboration. So <laughs> please, um, authors and panelists, please read the chats. I mean, I just really want you to share in all the appreciation you're getting. I, I promised you a great audience and I'm telling you, Becker's uh -huh. always has a great audience. Oh, and I really was gonna make another announcement because I know we have some loyalists that that file, follow our webinars and we do have another one coming up uh, December, uh-oh. December, somebody's going to help me, December 15th, I think it is. And it is called, uh, hold on, Make Every Pose Count. And it's a yoga workshop about integrating yoga into your curriculum. So I think we have a link for that as well. So anybody that loves to follow our webinars, please uh, don't miss that one coming up next. I'm going to take my video off and just enjoy the, the chat box. <laughs>